Hello and welcome back to the None of Our Businesses podcast and YouTube show. And we are doing our panel discussion. Uh, sometimes I call it AKA the round table. And we have uh, AJ here and Charlie. And uh, we're going to get right into it with a couple of articles today. All right. So uh, the article I found to talk about today was from MIT. And it is a, an article about how a model beats Wall Street analysts in forecasting business financials. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking alternate data is what they call it, but they take credit card statement data that they buy from people who run credit cards. And then they use that data to try to correlate it with earnings reports that are publicly available. And then they look for correlations that are um, what they call noisy, where the correlations aren't 100% perfect, but they find that this um, data is able is useful to predict how the actual companies are going to do, even though they're focusing in on only an excerpt of what that company's total revenue stream looks like. And so it's kind of counterintuitive because uh, it's a very small part of, of everything that that company does. But because that data is, uh, instead of just being at a point in time, like at the end of a quarter, or at the end of a month, which is what's traditionally available in publicly available financial statements, it's um, ongoing. So it's like they have pieces of data for every day. And so I wanted to talk about it, one, from the standpoint of I think it's interesting to try to use something tertiary to predict what's going to happen in, uh, in you know, revenue or in reports. But also, I think it's kind of an interesting ethical question of whether or not that credit card information or something that you would think would be your own information is you know being bought and sold and then used to predict these things and then used to predict them even more accurately than uh, traditional Wall Street analysts so it's actually a pretty accurate um, system and so yeah I just want to get your guys's take on did you know this was happening or have you ever heard of this before this alternate data no it kind of makes sense I think just to clarify the point we're talking about the credit card data we're referring to is on the sales side. So it's a company's uh, revenue or sales receipts that are going through credit cards yep. that, is, that we're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, yeah, it kind of makes sense. I wonder though, I wonder if the predictive value depends on the industry. Like, uh, like you would expect maybe an e-commerce company may have more predictive value based on the based on the credit card sales than an industry where credit card sales is a minority of of how they actually collect their revenue? I don't know. I don't think you're giving AI enough credit here. And this is another example of AI stealing our jobs. <clears throat> and I think we need to really rally behind these poor, unfortunate Wall Street forecasters that are going to be without jobs here soon. That's, I mean, that's, this is that's a drown, whole reason for bringing it listen, up. This is a downtrodden group that needs to be <laughs> brought up by their bootstraps. Yes. No, I, I'm just kidding, though. But what's funny is I everybody's acting like this is kind of new but I've heard of you know predictive AI stuff like this and mining public data way back in like 2010 I don't know if anybody remembers the target story where the father had like a young teenage daughter and was getting <clears throat> prenatal care and coupons for like you know like she was pregnant right yeah. and he furiously calls up target and it's like my you know my daughter's not pregnant quit sending us all this stuff but it turns out she was pregnant and through a through research of the stuff or you know i guess through ai machine learning through the stuff that she was buying from target target inferred she was pregnant before the parents knew she was actually pregnant yeah big increase in pickle purchases and stuff yeah. like that well it was something about vitamins too like yeah. she had a cocktail of prenatal vitamins that she was taking so obviously she knew she was pregnant but they knew then because of that cocktail of vitamins that she was you know, uh, taking them for the purpose of a, of a child. So it, I think it's just an increase in that and, and shows like the power behind what AI can do. Where I think usually people think of financial forecasting like this as kind of like a magic cauldron of, you know, like it's almost like a Vegas bet or like a betting line in Vegas where a group of guys get together and they kind of see what, what line's gonna move the needle on the bets. <clears throat> where financial analysts kind of go in and they look at historical data and then they kind of extrapolate that out to then see what they're projecting, you know, based on internal, what the internal people are saying and then what those quarterly reports are and then the market as a whole and they kind of aggregate that all down, not by hand anymore, but with the help of computer tools. But at the end of the day, it's usually somebody looking over it and, and analyzing it. And I think you're going to see that switch 
And just like in our industry, you'll see it switch to where the machine will be doing most of the most of the calculations and the and the aggregation of it, <clears throat> and a human will just be there to look at this output that it spits yeah. out and kind of interpret that. And I think um, I, the part that I, I guess the part that I missed is how, how, how is it that the public would get access to this data? It's, well, it's not the public. So what happens is that the target, as they run credit cards, will then sell the information off the credit cards they ran to a third party who's using it for this purpose. So I see. It's, it's to contrast against publicly available financial statements that are, are made to be shared but they're taking this piece of private data that they've bought and using it to project. Well, here's what's interesting about that, though, is so Target sells credit card data to a third party. What's the company that is being analyzed? And is it Target? It's it's uh, on a variety of companies, but in this example, I'm choosing Target, yeah. Yeah, so when you think about it, it's kind of like turning it back on the company itself, right? Because the I, I suspect that Target doesn't sell their credit card data for that purpose. They sell it because of the other data. The other side of the transaction data is what they think they're selling, right? Is what I would assume. <laughs> they're, not, they're not selling like, or maybe they're selling like information that's just volumes of certain kinds of consumer goods that are being purchased. I guess there's data there that they have that, that might be interesting. Because what I think about on that is like the company itself has this kind of information because uh, I would think because that they probably have the ability. Now you've worked you've worked in e-commerce and and dealt with credit card processing a bit, so you can tell me if I'm wrong. But I mean, w wouldn't a company be able to go into the the banking or the credit card website at certain times of the month and find out what the revenue stream was? Yeah, they can throughout. get their own. So yeah, but so yeah, it's not the information's existence and the is not is not really the. The existence of the information is not as groundbreaking as the sale. who has the yeah, information. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The interesting thing here is the fact that they're taking that and selling it, and then you you know turning that into a revenue stream for themselves. Right, right, and yeah, and it, I, I, the curious part from my standpoint is when Target started, when Target or we're using Target because I was an example, but it could be any of these companies, right? When they start selling credit card information to third parties. Were they anticipating that that was the use, or were they anticipating some other use? And because the because I don't know, there's a cynical side of me that's like sometimes we, there's this game being played by inside management versus outside analysts, where inside management always kind of knows more than outside analysts, and they don't necessarily they're not yet necessarily looking for ways to give outside analysts more information. And surely to that point, they could have right. I mean, they could have they could have it would have probably been subject to some kind of SEC issue, but they, they could have come up with a system of disclosing their credit card data in a way to be used uh, by analysts of their company um, in the past if that's what they wanted to do. So it's, I guess what I'm getting at, what seems um, kind of ironic about it to some extent is consumers, consumers, consumer advocate groups have been upset by companies like Target selling credit card information but to some extent, Target's management selling the credit card information is actually being pointed back against them now. Yes. Right? That, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're selling, they're, they're selling it, and then external analysts are actually using that to make evaluations of Target itself, which I kind of feel like probably wasn't what they wanted. That wasn't what they were selling it for. I guess it all depends on how much they're getting versus what the impact of having that be available was. I mean, you know, what, and what, damage did that do to their valuation versus what were they able to capitalize on so to that selling point, it. So I guess to that point, if they actually intended to <laughs> provide information to the market about their company by selling their credit card information, is that an SEC issue? <laughs> like, oh, you yeah. know, at what, right. you know, that, that, you're right. I mean, so I see, yeah, yeah. Cause it's, you know, providing information, providing that kind of public information, the way it's disclosed to it's disclosed to particularly, yeah, it's providing information that's not widely available to the public to certain parties based on a fee. Um, yeah. So you have to assume that they didn't intend to do that. And so, yeah, this may be, that'd be interesting to see if this may be an issue that the SEC actually does get into at some point. If companies are selling credit card information, which can be used in the valuation process of a company, of a public company, then they're, it, it's basically a way for them to provide inside information about what's going on in the company. What I'm wondering, I don't know, it probably doesn't, of course, probably it's 
uh, private, whatever. It's whoever the company is with the algorithm for the AI. Sure. It's you know their trade secret on how they're using this. But I'm wondering if we're looking at it too granularly, and it wasn't a macro look at like, oh, spending's up in like home improvement or home goods, and the aggregate data of that of sales information, not just particularly from one store. Although I don't know how you buy and sell credit card information on the on the internet or how those big data sets are are sold. Right. And what the, I guess it really depends on what the, what like that granule, how much granule information is available there, <clears throat> you know, per store. Yeah. Then can you see, you know, like to your point, right? Let's use Target and Walmart. Not right. that we're bagging on Target or Walmart, but use them because they're in similar markets or right. they're similar offerings. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Right. To your point. Yeah. And so. Does the so, analyst only get data that is includes both right. Target and Walmart, and or then can making they, inferences about both companies? Or, or can they view the credit card and, and sales data comparatively between the two? Right. Like I know this bunch came from purchases at Walmart, and I know this bunch came from Target. Now you can compare. Well, more people are spending money at Walmart than they are at Target, vice versa, right? right? right. Yeah. Rather yeah. than like, let's say, like a home. If you're looking at an overall macro version of of spending, right, and you're looking at Home Depot versus I don't know Lazy Boy, right? Right. Like, are people spending money on you know furniture? Are they making do? Or are they spending money on home improvement right. and right. and like you know uh, uh, valuation? No, you know? I, I totally feel your point. I mean, using Home Depot again, like your example, it's like well. If analysts know that in the aggregate the the demand through credit card purchases for home improvement goods has gone up, then you can assume, without knowing the specific company, that Home Depot and Lowe's and other companies like that are all benefiting from it, right? So, right. so they can infer that into how they analyze those companies. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if they're if they're analyzing this by by product in the macro or the industry in the macro, or if they're analyzing it by company. I mean, they're breaking it down by company. That's the inference of the article that they're they're coming up with specific valuations of companies based on the data. But are they actually looking at the company, the data by company, is is kind of the question you're asking. Yeah, it's not yeah. clear to me from the articles, but I think it is clear that they're definitely yeah trying to find as many of those connecting factors and identify those factors like what how to spend in an entire industry compare to targets, receipts for that period. Um, and just finding as many of those connections as they can and, you know, utilizing them to make inferences about what they think uh, each one would do. Yeah. Well, and then it begs the question, right? One of the big things about Wall Street is the, the, the pennies on the cent or, you know, like the, the percentages of one cent that are made on transactions due to the speed of the transaction going to the market. Mm -hmm. Where there's that intermediary, you've heard about this, right? The time it takes for you to hit enter and send on your trade on a computer. It takes however many microseconds for that to reach the market to initiate a buy or sell. And then somebody in between knows that you're buying or selling. Somebody in between that can act faster, who's actually physically closer to the market, can act ahead of time and make, you know, like tenths of a cent per transaction, but if they do this a million times over the day, they make millions of dollars sure. off of this. And then there was that, you know, like I think it was Canadian people or somebody that set up uh, an alternate exchange that you could go and you wouldn't get penny swindled basically <laughs> by these trades. But the but the point was is that the people, the big boys that played with the big money had the money and the and the infrastructure to build that system that was closer to the Wall Street to make the tenth of the cents, right? right? right. And I'm wondering if we're not looking at a similar situation where you're gonna see valuations and, and earning stuff be in the hands of a few that have access to like a really expensive AI kind of system. Yeah. And then everybody exactly. else is kind of left out in the dark. You know, because yes, this stuff is isn't cheap is. and nobody's giving it away for free, you know, not like yeah. so. Yeah, that's, it's, that's interesting. Um, kind of off on a, a tangent on that point is that what a lot of what I didn't know, I, I was about to say a lot of people didn't know, but I won't I won't put my own ignorance on everyone else uh, is that um, AI and big data are intimately related because one of the ways that technologists look at solving AI problems is by just shoving an enormous amount of data toward the machine learning so that it can it, it can basically learn from just these huge data sets and different scenarios. And so um, <clears throat> what you said that kind of inspired me on that whole point was this idea that this 
the big data play, which this is in some regard, right, is is in the hands of just a few who have the money and infrastructure to make that play. And that I think that's totally the case. I mean, right now it's like, well, either you are an organization that already is really big and so you have your own big data or you are um, or you're an organization with a lot of cash uh, that can go out and buy other people's big data. Um, and and I think that is when you when you talk, I, I've, I've said this kind of thing before in these. And so people might start getting kind of a, a hint of where my political leanings might be. But I think um, they also might be confused or mistaken because I don't know where my own political leanings are all the time. But 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 I think it you know it, it, it does circle back to this question of um, inequality and and the future of income inequality if if our world is running on AI technology and big data that is uh, that is owned by the few mm -hmm. um, and and but anyway what this made me think of was in this big eye the the idea that AI is actually uh, being uh, is related to big data that it is somewhat a big data problem is uh, there was a book and I can't remember the name of it so I'll, I'll see if we can find the name and we can put it in the comments or something in the description um, of this podcast but it was about um, a, it was like about AI the kind of the AI wars between China and Silicon Valley and how China's basically geared up to kick our ass on this game because mm -hmm. um, They've got a ton of data at their disposal, and and they're using, they have they have a program for this. They're they're using the data from their population to kind of feed their AI development right now, um, and that that's that is their competitive advantage in, in potentially winning the AI uh, battle against against us in the U.S. or against uh, the people in Silicon Valley. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't throw in the towel considering the amazing innovation that has come out of the US and Silicon Valley. So this the problem the problems of solving AI and big data and all that are um, are somewhat beyond me and they're um, well not just somewhat, they're very much beyond me. So I think there there's a lot more to the problems than just this big data point that I'm making. But anyway, I said it would be a tangent, it's a total tangent, but <laughs> but your comment reminded me of that point and something that I thought was just interesting is the connection between big data and AI development and how China's kicking our ass on it. Well, and just how much of it is brute forcing your way into an answer of just like utilizing exactly. so much data that you might not think is relevant, but once you look at it long enough and you see enough of it, you realize, well, a lot of things that don't seem relevant actually really are. It's just a matter of finding those connections. Well, and I think that is going to be the next kind of big natural, re not natural resource, but big resource that people start pulling from. And China has a massive head start on machine learning. You heard yeah. about like the surveillance, like face yeah. recognition stuff yeah. and that social kind of currency that they're trading in now that's kind of like a smartphone game, uh, smartphone app slash game, but it's basically your life, you know, and who you interact with and how you socially rank up. Yeah, no, I think that I think that was the kind of the overall point of the this author that I was thinking of, or at least that's the big takeaway that I got from it is exactly what you said. But that big data was the was the current gold rush, mm -hmm. but it's really an intermediary treasure because it is the path to AI, which is the ultimate treasure. It's who's going to own the AI technology in the future, and it's and and I think what this was getting at is. The people who are going to own the AI technology are the people that first owned the big data, because they're the ones who had the, the they're going to have the the ones who have the data to use the brute force methodology to <laughs> essentially solve AI problems. Right. Wow, I was way down the rabbit hole on that one. From very, very down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, these are real <laughs> issues. Yeah. 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 No, no get, get to the bottom of them. Yeah. So I uh, want to thank you both being here as always, AJ and Charlie, and uh, to our viewers and listeners, thank you for um, joining us and hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube and the notification icon so that you know when we've, we've got a new episode. And if you're listening on you know, Podcast Network, make sure to download us and subscribe to us so that you um, are staying up to date with our episodes as they come out weekly. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and we will see you all next time. See you next week. Thank you.